Hey, Ben, how you doing? I'm doing very well, Jason. It's good to be with you today. Yeah, good to see you. Ben Neely, you're with the Berks History Center? That's correct, yeah. Yeah, how, ma how many uh, months or years have you been there? I just passed two-year mark. Wow, just it just seems ago, like yeah. yesterday you were... You... It, it does, yeah. It, it, I still feel like the new guy there. Yeah. Really? Yeah, very much so. But, uh, but it, it feels like home at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's... Uh... We were going to, we'll get into that a little bit. I, I wanted to hear one of the things that we like to do in the interviews is for folks to share their stories, how they got involved in their, you know, in their career. Of course, in the museum arts culture world, we have our own little niches that we focus on. You know, some of us yeah. are more, you know, lean more to history, some art, conservation, whatever. So just share your story a little bit with us. Okay. How you got started? Well, uh, you know, the history field, it was, it's a, you know, sort of a second career for me. I, I got started, um, my undergraduate work was all in marketing. And uh, I did, you know, business administration and marketing and uh, graduated with a four-year degree in marketing. And, and part of that was because I just didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. You know, even <laughs> even going through college, I just I just didn't know. And I was taking, you know, the well-worn path by, you know, other family members. I thought, I'll, I'll do this, too. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> and I got started. And but, you know, as I, you know, was going through this and I was still early in the career, a few years outside of, of college, and I was just not loving it. And I don't think I want to do this for the rest of my life. And I. Mm -hmm it was, it was just sort of seeking something that made me happy. And history was always something that I had, you know, a love of. And um, I took a lot of history courses when I was in college, because they came very naturally to me. And it allowed me to focus on the areas that I was, that I struggled with, you know, there was a, in marketing, there was a lot of statistics classes and things like that. I think I got up to like stats three and I was horrible. I was horrible at it. I was just barely passing these things. I was a C it was just such a victory for me in these classes, but history came very easy. You know, I, I, you know, sometimes I'd get the book list for a history class I'm like oh, I, already, I already have these books I already read those books um, wow. and so I thought I'm going to do this but I wasn't actually thinking about museum field initially I thought I'm going to go be a history teacher and I thought I'm going to be a great history teacher they're going to make a movie about me one day I'm going to show up in costumes right. to classes and such I'm just show up to the classroom and they're throwing paper airplanes and you're yes. all around that's right I thought I thought I'm just gonna I'm gonna change lives and um so I started substitute teaching uh, and, and I very quickly was like, I'm never going to make it here ever. Wow. <laughs> but it, it, I also had a, um, a been accepted at Shippensburg University and I came down from upstate New York. I chose Shippensburg University because one, I liked their program. They had a, a program applied history and I thought I could do that with a few other additional credits in education and I'd be good to go. Uh -huh. And uh, so I got into to grad school and uh, I wanted some real like experience in the field though. I wanted to be able to be, you know, a teacher who in the field who actually had worked in the history field as well. Mm -hmm. And so I, I got a list from a uh, graduate uh, advisor and uh, I had asked him, I said, listen, I need, this needs to all turn into an actual job when I'm done. What am I, what am I going to do here? And he said, well, here, and he gave me this list of places. It was alphabetical and the top of the list, a Adams County historical society. And <laughs> so I was familiar with that. I was like, oh yeah, sure. I've seen that was in a lot of my uh, Gettysburg books. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll give them a call. So I did. And uh, the rest was history. I was just like gum on their shoe. They couldn't get rid of. I started off as a volunteer there and wow. uh, decided I did not want to teach. Uh, I thought, wow, if I stay here in the museum, like doing museums and archives and I get to do whatever I want, I can teach whatever it is that I'm interested in or what I see people are interested in and get to help them more. And so I did it. And uh, so I started volunteering there and you know, work my way up. And I stayed there until I was executive director of the uh, Adams County Historical Society and then left there for Berks History Center just a couple of years ago. Where, where were you living at? Were you, where were you living at the time when you started volunteering at, at Adams County? 
you know, I was actually bouncing between places. So I, my folks live in Hanover, PA, um, okay. which is not far from Gettysburg. And then I have a brother in Carlisle. Okay. And so I had tubs from Walmart in the back of my pickup truck they owned at the time, filled with books and everything I needed for my classes. I, I, um, I needed a paying job too. So I was working for what was then the Friends of the National Parks at Gettysburg okay. at their Rupp House History Center. It's now part of the Gettysburg Foundation. Right. And I, you know, I got started there just answering tourist questions and, uh, uh, and then developed that and started doing walking tours and such for them. And I uh, just, just was loving it. Now, a mutual friend and colleague of ours, uh, Wayne Motts, we have to give a big shout out to him because he is now yes. Gettysburg Foundation president and chief executive officer. And he way is. to go, Wayne. Yes, and he, he had he had a little bit of a stint associated with the historical society, correct? He did. In fact, it was Wayne Motts who answered the phone the day I called to see if I could volunteer, uh, and he has been my mentor ever since. I I owe so much to Wayne Motts, and he is the guy I call when I don't know what to do. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've had some of those uh, men, mentor mentee conversations from him to me um, yeah. over the years as well. He yeah. is outstanding individual. Yeah. Yeah. So, so he answered, you started volunteering and then, um, so from the time you were volunteering to executive director at the historical society, how many years was, were you involved there? Oh, let's not see. You're not involved anymore, but. Yeah. yeah. Um, boy, I guess it was about 14 years or so. Wow. Yeah. That was there for a good long while. Yeah. And then how did you hear about uh, Burke's History Center? I had heard that um, Simon Bertolette uh, was the executive director of the Burke's History Center, and he was retiring. And I heard that, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I actually, I went to the PA Museum's website and checked the job postings there. And I was like, oh, I wonder what the, they've got uh, posted there. And I read it, and I, and I looked at their website. I thought, that's actually a pretty cool place. Yeah, I think I'd like to check this out. So I ended up throwing my hat in the ring and it worked out. Yeah. Now, Syme undertook a pretty big rebranding and renaming campaign when he was there. Can you can you share yeah. with us kind of maybe a little bit of that history? I can. Yeah. So uh, doing the forensics on this, um, it looked like it took place around 2012, 2013, somewhere in there. And for many years, since 1869 up to that point, it was the Historical Society of Berks County. Okay. Which is actually still the legal name. Okay. So we do be, you know, we're a DBA doing business as the Berks History Center. And the rebranding was a, you know, one of the things they wanted to do to try to demystify what they were, you know, you know, the, you know, the, the the idea that the his you know the phrase historical society and i had heard this you know in adams too was you know it was you know implied exclusivity mm. and wasn't as welcoming a term as as they want as they you know wanted to be mm. and so they along with some others in our area actually switched over to using the word uh history center i think chester county just did this too now they're the chester county history center Mm -hmm. so but ours is shorter it's uh burke's history center and um and i have to say it's even after they did that years ago as i've been introducing myself in, in the area i'll say oh you know i'm you know ben neely i'm the new executive director at the burke's history center and i can tell they're they're not quite connecting and i said we were the historical side of burke's county oh of course yes you guys so um i think we still have even even this long afterwards it's it's difficult to kind of move away from the old name so i think that's something we're still working out there yeah well, let's 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 unpack that a little bit more because sure. um, i think if folks see the the tags in this video they, they especially our friends that work in historical societies throughout the commonwealth they might be interested mm -hmm. in this conversation in particular but i think a lot of historical societies are grappling with this big question at, and sometimes there's a lot of push from board members. We need to change the name. We need to change the name. Yeah. And, you know, I've often wondered, are we going to see this massive wave of historical societies, maybe not only in Pennsylvania, but 
in the, you know, in the country where it's just going to be this sh major shift that them all becoming history centers. And, you know, what does that mean? And what are the ramifications right. of that? Um, so, yeah, I mean, so you shared a little bit about, um, I mean, you would say that it, overall though, it's been a, it's been a benefit. I think, I, I think probably it, it has been, um, I'm not sure if I would have, because I was under the same pressure in Adams to change uh -huh. and I didn't want to do that. Um, and, and primarily in Adams, because I thought, well, we still had a lot that we wanted to do. We were looking at sort of not like a massive reinventing of ourselves, but we were looking to change what we were doing and um, uh, so much identity tied to our location at the Lutheran Seminary in Gettysburg. I thought, let's 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 kind of develop more about what we want to be and what our new vision is and where we're going to be and what are we going to do when we get there. I kind of likened it like, you know, if I write a, you know, a paper or an article or, or whatever, I, I title it at the end um, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, coming up with a, the title first and writing to that right. the whole time. Let's figure out what we're going to be and then we'll label it. Um, yeah. And I don't know enough about the details of that process at the Berks History Center, but I can tell you that I, you know, in my time there, I've had people compliment us and say that was a really good move mm -hmm. uh, you, you should do that but i have also heard from people who said that was uh that was terrible you lost your identity when you did that and you had to start over mm -hmm. um yeah. and i think both sides make points on that i, yeah. I think maybe we still have work marketing you know work to do to cement who we are and make that stick um yeah, but uh, you know we are. You know, it, it, I think it's open doors as well. Yeah, one of the questions I like to ask when I'm when I have a workshop with uh, museums or especially historical societies, I ask this question: If we didn't have a building, would we still have a mission? Mm. And that gets a lot of you know sort of heads sort of spinning because it really makes you think wait, if we didn't have a building, and, and, you know, some folks without, you know, revealing any names or anything, or some folks will say, well, you know, I guess, yeah, we would just pack up. We, you know, if, if our building burned down, I guess we'd just dissolve. And, and then how revealing is that? Like, well, then what does that say about your, your core mission and what you're doing, you know, aside from, your, you know, trying to keep a building open? I'm sorry, I got it broke up a little bit there, Jason. What was the the, the question at the end? Oh well, you, you heard about the you heard me say about the the sort of provocative question: if we didn't have a building, would we yes. self mission? Yeah. Yes. And I was saying, you know, in in sometimes in workshops or in retreats, I'll I'll present that to uh, the staff and the board, and it gets you know people really thinking. And um, there was there was one person in an organization that that had said that, well, I guess if our building burned down, we would just pack it up and dissolve the organization. And mm -hmm. for me, that was very revealing because it just, it just really made me think, wow, like what does that say about that person's perspective on their mission? You know, it's almost like keeping the building open. Right, the, okay. The, the, the MO and, and not the, the, the core mission behind the scenes. It's sort of the, the life force behind what, what they're doing. So, but anyway, I think that gets mm -hmm. to your point of kind of the analogy of writing the book first uh, and then titling it. I, I think getting at you know, what the core mission is, letting that manifest in its most perfect way, however that looks, and then, and then coming up with the mm -hmm. branding that fits that i'm not saying that and i'm i know you're not saying that's not what they did at burke's history center and i i guess case mm -hmm. by case right each organization has to make a decision based on their circumstances yes. yeah i agree yeah yeah so um so you've been there uh where, where is the history center located we're in redding pennsylvania okay and uh we're in we're in downtown redding all right um, and there you have a little bit of a campus there. We do. We have two buildings. Uh, okay. So we have a museum building and that is the oldest part. Uh, 
It was built in 1928 uh, by the by the History Center. Uh, so we've it's been our building from day one, and it was expanded in 1988. And then they acquired a building on the opposite corner in 2008, and that is where our library is located today. Okay. Now, do you have any logistical challenges related to where the museum and main buildings located and the, the other building? <laughs> I'll tell you what. So this is my first experience of managing, you know, a one crew in two buildings. And the yeah. biggest challenge that I find is, you know, it's sort of like in, in like silos, you know, it's like the library and the museum are, yeah. you know, different organizations, you know, it's, you know, pulling everybody together. And it's not that uh, at least why I've been there, that there's been a lot of internal fighting or whatever, but it's sort of like uh, your building, their building kind of thing, instead of looking at it, you know, more globally as our buildings, yeah. <laughs> you know, if so it, that I think has been the biggest challenge, but we're, we're so close together uh, that, you know, logistically it, it it's fine. It's, it, it's funny, just one little tiny street dividing the two places, and it's like they're two separate countries. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that, that has been a little wild to me. <laughs> I was always uh, envious when I would visit uh, Chester County Historical Society at, well, now Chester, Chester History Center, or I um, hope I'm getting the name correct, but they have that little corridor that, that they were able to build across the, that little alleyway or street. Yeah that connects to that, that other building. And that's gotta, I would hope, think that that helps a little bit, just having a connector like that. I would love, I would love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you have uh, power lines or uh, something in the way or just logistically, it's just really- Yeah, we can't. Out. We have one building that's in the historic district, our museum building, the old building is in the historic district and we are the like on the line. The library building, I can do whatever I want. I can paint it purple, uh, <laughs> make, you know, put it, you know, extra stories on it, blow it. I do whatever I want to it, but right. not the museum building. Museum building, everything goes through the historical and architectural review board. Yeah, I can't change the gutters on that one without going through, <laughs> I don't know how many committees and meetings. I guess you could, but yeah, it takes, takes some hoops. Yeah, yeah. So I can't imagine how much heartburn they'd get if I went to them with a proposal like, hey, I'm just going to run a you know, passway over the top of the street here, connect our buildings. <laughs> yeah. you, and then what's your staffing like there? We have uh, nine staff right now. Okay. And uh, four, uh, full, four, four will be full, four full-time, five part-time. Mm -hmm. How was it? Uh, I guess everybody adjusted to the shutdowns and the pandemic and everything. Did you, you, you guys did okay with all the Zoom meetings and all that stuff? We did, but I did notice a strain on the staff. Like the morale was low. Uh -huh. And I noticed like everyone seemed really, I noticed that just that there was a lot of like, people seemed irritated with one another and such sometimes a little easier, a little quicker than normal. And, all this and, and everyone was just real tired and I think part of it was like I, I learned how much business we conduct just by running into each other at the water cooler you yeah. know and those small simple interactions being able to pop into somebody's office for 45 seconds right. instead of like planning like a phone call or sitting down and pounding out another email or or setting up a zoom call or whatever like it was such an effort to do even the the most minor things right. um that once we got back, I noticed everyone's mood uplifting immediately. It was it was such a change, just getting everybody back in really allevi alleviated a lot of that. And I, I think what was happening is people were getting stressed and their outlet was to sort of point at what somebody else was doing and say, hey, wait a minute, I don't like what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and, but it, when everything sort of came down a little bit, uh, it was it was real nice, yeah. I think a lot of executive directors or staff in general, you know, I think it was a time that a lot of places just needed a lot of compassion and patience yeah. and, and empathy. And I think there was a real 
from what I've seen talking to colleagues is that there, there was, there's always, there was this, especially during the heart of the pandemic, there was this tension where there was sort of a panic kind of setting in. And sometimes that was coming from board leadership of, oh no, what are we gonna do? And what are we gonna do with the funds? And then you had executive directors just trying to temper some of that and, and lead with compassion and patience. And it's such a balancing act, right? It, it was. My number one priority I was telling the board was, we, I want everybody to come through this with their mental health intact. I don't want work to be this additional worry on everything else that we have right now. And yeah. we have important things we need to do. And we have legitimate worries, concerns here at the History Center. But our first priority has to be coming through this as whole as possible. Right. And so, and, and, and it forced me, you know, I had to let some things go. I really had to pick battles like, and, you know, it was very careful you know, with, you know, where I was going to wade in and, and, you know, offer criticism because criticism at some points, however, contrast constructively offered and how, how, you know, offered with kindness could, you know, would sometimes put folks on the defensive and it wasn't really what our exchange wasn't really causing. It was what they had going on in the background. Right. Um, and I want, I, I wanted to alleviate that as much as possible. I, I, I knew I could handle the financial end of it which was the other thing everybody was worried about. And I was worried too, but I felt confident that I could figure that one out as long as we all stayed as a team, we yeah. were going to be okay. Well, and the, the, uh, some of the funds that were coming, like the PPL funds, I mean, they were, I mean, more paperwork, but they were relatively easy to, to sort of navigate. Yes to secure for institutions i mean if you worked with your yes. local bank it was pretty pretty simple yes yeah, yeah. um so what um what do you think is a is a major story there in in the in the town that um the history center is trying to tell or there are a couple different threads is, but is there a, a core story that that the history center rallies around <clears throat> I think the this if you go through our museum, uh, there's much of it is developed, you know, is about the early development of Berks County. I would say, you know, a good healthy portion of that is is sort of divided between the earliest history, and then there's a leap forward and looks at the manufacturing history in Berks County, um, hmm. it, with major companies there, like that, you know, that are that were really famous that I knew from being outside the area, like Palmer Candy and such. Uh, looking at at that, uh, all the all the food manufacturing that was there, and of course the railroad and all that. Those those are some of the big stories that are there now. Hmm. Um, I think what's what we're trying to do and focus on is what's missing from that. You know, we have the PA German history story and such. We we have everything covered up rather well up through about 1900 but we really don't have any of the subsequent waves of immigration that have come through you know from the late 19th century or, you know yeah late 19th century up through the 20th century kind of is part of the interpretation there so we're yeah. looking to see what we can do about that well we talked about kind of the the conversation happening in historical size about name changes i, I know yeah. another big conversation is the the tension between telling the the quote unquote local whether it's the county or town history versus the the tension of oh we've got to do something bigger to to attract folks that really they might not really care about the local history so how do you sure. get them in the door and I think historical societies are always struggling with how to do that in the right way. Yeah. Um, and some historical societies, um, you know, they can play with some local history and, and cast it in kind of that national light. But, you know, is that really enough to kind of get, you know, the person traveling through the area to come visit you? Right. And yeah. Do you have any other thoughts about that? Boy, that is something that we struggle with, you know, when I was in Gettysburg, we could, we could use the battle of Gettysburg, right? That was the cash yeah. cow. You just, you were, you were out of ideas. You do the battle of Gettysburg because you could, it, everyone's showing up for that. Right. Uh, in Reading, you know, I'm still learning that, you know, and I've been like, well, geez, do we need to like 
reach out to these traveling exhibits like and get like a lego exhibit in here is that what we need and, and right. we'll we'll get people in the door and then hope you know they come in for the lego exhibit and then they're like oh wow look at look at all these other things that are here that's my family name on the wall let me go learn some more about that is that what i need to do to get them through the door yeah. and there's some days where i'm like if that's what's going to take to get some attention then, then let's do it and then other times I'm a little bit more like of a purist. I'm like, no, wait a minute. Right. can't do that. Jeez, it was. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's too far. That's mission creep or whatever. But um, I think we do have to get creative to see, you know, if we can get some folks through the door. That has to be the primary. Or these places don't exist. Yeah. Uh, you know, if we can't get, you know, you know, young generation to get interested in us because, you know, the, you know, a place like ours, the, um, you know, the, the place the people have supported it they're running out and we're gonna we won't have them for too much longer yeah there you go you were lagging a little bit i i heard this term um i think it was called it was social bridging where there's like mm -hmm. an example of you're walking your dog in the park and someone else has a dog and they the dogs meet um I think Nina Simon might have told this story, um, but the dogs meet and they're like that kind of social bridge where, you know, you start talking about each other's dogs and oh, what kind of dog do you have? And then the conversation shifts to the actual people talking to each other about their life or where they work or whatever, and they get really engaged with one another. I think the idea was like, what kind of exhibits or programs create that, that bridging for people? Like, you know, I think I saw somewhere at some museum, I think it was a maritime museum where they had like, you know, come show us your tattoo or something. And then they had a, an exhibit that was maritime tattoos. Okay. But they had people come and they could be on exhibit, so to speak, and share the story of the tattoo that they got. Okay. Which might have not, you know, it didn't have anything to do with maritime history. It could have just been, a, I don't know whatever right. <laughs> tribal symbol or something but they it got people to bridge that gap and that's kind of an intriguing way to kind of approach things yeah i like that smart but it, we're all struggling with it because we're trying to balance kind of putting those theories into practice with the behind the scenes stuff of when's payroll get processed and yes is QuickBooks updating properly? Is it going to crash <laughs> our server again? I mean, you don't right. have those issues there, do you? No, no, none of that ever happens for us. <laughs> we we just focus on nothing but history. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, your I've marketing. Joked. Oh, go ahead, Ben. I was going to say I, I've joked that I think I my job there is is some days I just feel like I'm the facilities manager. I just come in and find out like what broke today. Okay, great. Well, I'll call the elevator guy, the IT company and the AC people. Uh, <laughs> and that's what that, There's my day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I had this running joke for a while where I felt like I, because there's this perception of, you know, you work at a historical society, you know, you're smoking a pipe and reading dusty books all day long. Yes. But I had this running joke where I think I could be blindfolded and they could lift me out of my seat and put me in any other small nonprofit and take the blindfold off. And I could just go on autopilot with all of that other stuff that is yes. just not, I mean, it's so a huge percentage of your time is it's just basic nonprofit business management. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so I was going to ask you, have you found that your marketing background has, has, uh, helped you or colored your perspective at all on you know with your work there yeah i think it's been an asset and i was concerned that it was gonna be something that always held me back mm -hmm. i thought you know i i you know because i didn't have an undergraduate degree in, or degree in history and a lot of my historical knowledge um was you know self-taught and self-directed that that it was going that i was just never going to get you know too far but I have found, though, that it's the skills that I learned there, uh, you know, help me, you know, having that business background and, you know, analyzing, you know, trends and what's going on and, and just, you know, it, you know, looking at helping to read people 
and see see what they're they're looking for. What am I learning uh, from surveys and such so that I can react to it? Um, it's helped me not move. I, I don't move very much on anecdotal data. I like I like real data, um, mm -hmm. and we'll and we'll seek it out. And I think that is uh, very been very helpful. But and also it's it helped me even even being a curator. Um, you know, I've run into you know you know archivists and curators who you know they are just you know they they're very strict. They're within these certain lanes of what what is what you can do and 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 they're and they're doing good things they're 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 there they're to protect the collection mm -hmm. and um i would joke i was like listen if i put you in charge of the elevator bill you'll be you know you'll set up a program in two seconds where people making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with civil war bayonets and you're, you're going to get over it and and it'll help you push your boundaries a little bit as to what i was going to do to build access to the collections how far will i push that and i would never do anything where i i, I will i do not want to put you know any collections in harm's way right. but i will really consider stretching those boundaries if it brings people in and lets them interact with things in a very personal way and less of there's the object behind the glass with the with a excellently written text card next to it um and yeah. letting them get behind the glass and, and really get into it and strive to get people to, to have some real you know experiences that they can take away um you know if they're not going to remember every name and date i don't care but if they can walk away with some, something felt um then i'm happy and um so i've i've really ended up feeling like the, the marketing has helped me in the end just be creative and be open to, to new things you, you mentioned something about um the, the data and you know i know that um uh there's there's a lot thrown at at us when it comes to ideas for marketing Yes. You know, someone will say, oh, if we just had that billboard out on whatever, or we, right. we just did this, like, that's going to be the silver bullet. And I'm sure there's a lot of, um, you know, you can go chasing a lot of wild, you know, phantom things um, with, without having sort of that solid understanding of, okay, what's the, what's the demographics and the audience and what's the yes. data telling us? Because you, I mean, you can spin your wheels a lot with that stuff. Yes. Yeah, I think I think you do have to do your research, and and I, you know I I always ask probing questions because it's often some, somebody come to me and say, well, everybody wants us to do this. I was like, okay, well, tell me about everybody. Who who's everybody? How did you come to everybody? And I'll find out that like they had a conversation, like one phone call got translated to everybody by the time they're talking to me, you know, and. <laughs> Uh, or, or nobody. It, the opposite yeah. too. nobody wants you to do that right <laughs> yeah well, let me talk to nobody exactly let's let's let them come forward and 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 let me have it then if everybody wants it then just let me have it you send them all right to me <laughs> and uh and nobody's coming so yeah. i I'm, I'm always skeptical of that and uh and then it just things like membership is is a big deal for organizations like ours uh I think we could have a whole set of series of conversations about membership. Um, but, you know, uh, right now, uh, a real, real is, is, you know, our group wants to be like every county fair, every, any fair in there, is, we're going to go there and we're going to push our membership program. Mm -hmm. And while I think, okay, we'll show up to these fairs, that's that maybe not be too bad an idea, but I'm trying to temper everybody's expectations on membership sales because uh, how many families do you think are running out the door between and one spouse turns the other and says, oh, honey, why don't you grab an extra 60 bucks in case there's a nonprofit to join mm -hmm. at the fair? Um, it, that's, that's not what they're coming to do. Yeah. And so that is not necessarily what I want to be there, you know, making our main drive to push. Um, yeah. But I don't mind being there to raise awareness of what we're doing and have some neat little activities and try and recruit them back, back to our home base. Yeah. You know. I, I was involved with a, um, a decision to print um, what seemed to be like a million books, but we, we, the, the Cumberland County historical side was involved with um, uh, publishing a, a book about the history of the car show. 
Okay. Some of you, you know, Ben, some of the viewers know that the, the car show is huge in, in Carlisle. Mm -hmm. And so we had amazing author and we did this beautiful book and we like, we decided to um, publish a, I think we, I think we published maybe a hundred, 150 of them. And we booked our time. They got a little booth at the car show. Guess yeah. how many of those books we sold? <laughs> How'd you do? We sold one book over, <laughs> you know, we're thinking there's thousands of people. They love cars. Right. Why wouldn't they want a book about the car, the car show history? Right. And, you know, how it evolved in the family and, you know, pictures of people, you know, bringing cars on site for the you know first few years and all that stuff. And it's like one of those things where like the marketing just alluded, you know, it's just, it just went past us. It was beyond our, our expertise. You know, we made yeah. an assumption and we all, you know, we, we slowly sold them in our gift shop. We got, you know, we were able to sell them, sure. but you might think you've got this audience on you know, locked down right. and it's just, it's not that way sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we've all been burned by those things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I guess the good news is that we, we did the, the pub publishing in house. So we were able to, you know, it wasn't like we sent it out and, you know, there wasn't a huge gap or something in the in the expense but um so do you have anything yeah. uh like the the your vision moving forward i mean it if hopefully we get past this variant and more variants to come uh i mean beyond the pandemic right. and kind of the longer term vision for the history center i mean are there are if you can disclose them are there any grand ideas that you'd like to see happen I would, I really want to see our museum interpretation expand to include like Latino history of Berks County. They, uh, Latino population uh, in Berks County is, um, it's, it's nearly a quarter of the total population. And hmm. we don't have anything, we don't have any exhibits uh, about their history at our museum. And I really want to change that. And that's hard to do um, to get, uh, you know, get a population that has been underserved to start looking at you as a resource and, and want to, we're starting at the beginning. So uh, I've just got a lot of folks coming over to tour the history center and see what we're about now and, and learn about where we want to go. And, and I'm really interested in their input. Like, what do they think we ought to do? and see if they're interested in serving on some sort of a task force that would work with an exhibit design firm to come in and help us do some master planning. So before I start changing any exhibits, I wanna develop a real good master plan of what we can do and what kind of education programs can we put together that will complement that. Mm -hmm. And I want to set up and be more dynamic. I'll share a story with you. I, there's this one exhibit there, it's a Victorian parlor. And it's meant we're right on the edge of City Park in Reading, which is where the height of wealth in Reading was in the late uh, 1800s, early 1900s. These beautiful mansions. And this room's me, meant to evoke that. Let me interrupt you real quick. So this is like a kind of a moment in time setting of a yes. parlor in the exhibits. It's got yes. a, a whatever a side chair and that kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Walk in there. It looks like you walked into a room you know, around 1900. And uh, all right. So I'm with somebody who's, who's, who's looking, you know, with me in the museum, and she's uh, now a PhD historian at a university. She shared with me, she's like, you know what, I, I helped build this room in 1982, when I was doing my internship here at the History Center. Well, mm -hmm. she said historical society, but that's what it was then. And, uh, and I was like, and she was just Fill of all this wonderful, warm, nostalgic feeling. And I, I asked her, does it, does it look the same? She's like, it looks exactly the same. And she's so happy. And inside my head, I'm screaming, going, oh my gosh, this room, it looks exactly the way it did when like E.T. was in the movie theater. That's, this can't be. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, no wonder why nobody wants to come back here. <laughs> you know, so I really want to see the History Center designed to be, um, 
designed for repeat business. Mm -hmm. um, it, right now it's set up for the same people to keep coming back again and, and just love what's there. I want them to come back because there's some new way we're presenting it. We've got new stories in, we're rotating things and out. And also every time I ask somebody, what's your favorite story from Berks County history? They'll tell me some story and it's not in the museum. Mm. It's like great stories about the mafia and in Berks County and all this great political uh, friends. I'm like, why isn't that in the museum? That would be an outstanding. So how much fun could we have with something like that? Right. So I want to, I want, I really want to inject fun into it. I want it to be inclusive and I want it to be fun to go yeah. to the Berks History Center and tour the exhibits there. Yeah. And then our library side, more often, I, you know, I want it, I, I want people to be able to do more research remotely. Uh, we have some people that, you know, they just can't take a day off from work and come in and do research and we can't be open, you know, when they're, it's convenient for them. I want to, as, as much as possible, begin to build our capacity online for folks to do research in their pajamas on a Sunday morning or late at night and, and get as close to an experience as you could as if you came to visit us on site, you know, just as, as push that as far as we can within the limits of, copyright and intellectual property rights and what is possible to digitize and find a way. I mean, of course, we have to keep the lights on. So how do I do that in a way that also generates enough income to actually support all that we'd have to do to make that happen at the same yeah. time? So, uh, th but those are the things I'd like to accomplish over the next few years. Yeah. Before we wrap up with the, um, the lightning round, do you have a, do you have, give a takeaway to an executive director at a historical society in terms of leadership style or creating a culture, what would be a tip or a, like a, you know, some, some advice, even if maybe it's someone who's, it's their first being an executive director for the first time in a historical society. Um, maybe something that just transcends you know, just like kind of, you know, raw management, like, but like mm -hmm. in terms of personality, creating a culture, would you have a, you have a tip for them? Yes. I, you know what, I, for me, I remember that everyone has a very unique point of view of, from their vantage point of the organization. You can never know everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's important to, important to check in with people and that you sh that shouldn't undermine, that doesn't undermine your authority and it shouldn't, you know, hurt your confidence to, you know, to be going to the, somebody who's, you know, running the front desk and asking them what they think about something. Mm -hmm. it's incredible where some of the best ideas come from. Mm -hmm. And so I really encourage uh, everybody to, to really look at your people as they're just tremendous resources that see things in a way that you just can't because right. you constantly have somebody in your face, you're drinking from the fire hose all the time. And, you know, go to some of those folks and ask them what they think because you'll get, you'll get tremendous advice and they'll, yeah. and they'll appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. And like, to, any, like I found to that point too, to piggyback on that a little bit, is it, um, you know, that you might think you have a certain idea about how everyone is unified ab about something. You mm -hmm. might, in your mind, you might think, yeah, we're all on the same page, but then you might, without those interactions and those just keep prodding and those questions of what do you really think about this? Mm -hmm. uh you know you can't like you think oh we're all on the same page and then maybe you'll go to a meeting and like wait a minute no we're not on the same page or uh but that's really important especially if you got a vision in mind or you got a, some yeah. big initiative everybody i mean is they're going to see it differently but the, you gotta everybody has to know what they're doing yes and that helps quite a bit yeah yeah Sometimes I would think, oh, you know, I'm, I'm communicating this so well. <laughs> Everybody's getting it. They're all smiling. Yeah. yeah. But even like smiling at a meeting. Like I was hearing on the radio the other day. It's like you can't even judge, you know, frowns or smiles or anything. Right. Until, until you dig in there, like you were saying, and really get at what people are, what their perspective is. You just don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this is Ben. This has been a lot of fun. I have a lightning round. Okay. Um, this is a we 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 do this to wrap up, just to kind of uh, give folks a sense of your personality, a um, little bit more of a sense of your personality. Okay. So, are you a dog, cat, or no pets person? I, I, I 
I'm a dog person, although we don't have a dog right now, but I would say I'm a dog person. I grew up with dogs. <laughs> so just ever since you're a little kid. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Not one yet though. Not, not now. We have a uh, fish and a hermit crab. <laughs> <laughs> But birds, we have birds. How can yeah. I forget the birds? Sometimes you're at a stage in your life where you think, man, I just don't know if I can handle one jumping up on me now and I'm going <laughs> to fall or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was always thought, you know, if I if I moved to like a little farmette or something, I would love to have a dog. Like just yeah. running around and just give them the space they need and everything. Oh, yeah, they're great. <laughs> Okay, can you share any show online that you binged watched during during the pandemic? <laughs> or maybe yeah. you didn't watch any shows. <laughs> no, I did uh, constantly. I watched, uh, I drilled through uh, Star Wars Clone Wars animated series. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a giant child. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> okay. You know, we, we love star Wars in our house. I got to check that out. You think? Yeah. Like yeah. Is it, it's good for kids and adults. Huh? Or, oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And there's yeah. a new one now, I think. Just, yeah, the bad batch. And I, I'm, I'm current on that. All right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you heard it from Ben Neely. <laughs> and then, um, all right. So the big anniversary year, there was a big spread in the magazine about Jaws. And uh, you, J Jaws, the original movie from 19, yes. whatever it was. 1975, I think it came yeah. out. So we're going to get really honest here. On a scale yeah. of one to 10, one being not so good, 10 being like the best movie ever. Where, where would you rank Jaws in terms of actually a, a good movie or not? Oh, <laughs> uh, I'd have, you know what? I'd have to give it a 10 because I am, I am permanently afraid of the ocean. Like I'll go to the beach and I go in the ocean. I've never been in the ocean where <laughs> I haven't like been fully aware that like when I was back on shore, I was top of the food chain and now I'm like fourth down, you know, I'm, I'm not at the top anymore and I can't see in the water. And I just think, why am I in this water? And it's all back to Jaws. I cannot go into the ocean without in the back of my head. Like, this is it. I, this is how I chose to die was to go in the water today. Wow. Uh, the shark's going to get me. Well, I'll tell you something that I've just failed as a parent, I think. <laughs> my my old, eldest son and I, he's 11. We watched yeah. Jaws a couple of days ago. And we're going to Assateague Island for two days. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> this week oh is that like horrible or what i i don't know what i was thinking i don't know hopefully the you know it, it'll work out better for you than me i just i go and i tell everybody else that it's silly i lie to them <laughs> like you have nothing to worry about in this water get this all we're all getting in the water well i'm probably more scared than anybody <laughs> so in terms of yeah i you know i i watched it the other day and i think in terms of some of the campiness and I didn't even judge the special effects because I think I thought they were pretty good for 1970s or whatever. I just thought that oh, yeah. overall, some of the acting, it was inconsistent and like, it was just kind of, but in terms of the, like you're saying the impact on people's psyche. Yeah. yeah it's like a 10, yeah. right? Yeah. That's, that's what I I'm judging it on. It, it permanently damaged me. And uh, so I have to give it a 10. <laughs> Shoo. So, uh, okay, well, now we got your score there. Um, ben, anything else you wanna share before we wrap up? Oh boy, I, I wish I had really great parting words and quotes, but uh, <laughs> I don't. That's all right. <laughs> well, but, uh, uh, this is really, you're really breaking up. <laughs> nice. I really, I, I, I think you're saying you know, this is one of the things I appreciated it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I was. Yeah. My back. Yeah, you're back. 
Yeah, so uh, thank you for your service to okay. uh, historical societies in, in Pennsylvania and at the History Center, Burke's History Center, and also your service on the a board, a PA Museum's board. Um, thank you for that work. That hey, thanks did. a lot. Yeah. All right, for you sure. take care. All right, you too. Talk to you later. All right, bye. Bye.